Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all today to our Christ uh, Christmas event, both those of you who are here in person at the National Liberal Club, but also those joining us remotely. And a particularly warm welcome to our panel, who I will introduce shortly. As many of you are aware, this is not only the last GSF event of the year, it's also the last in our regular series of events. For a number of reasons, as I outlined in my letter to GSF subscribers, I reluctantly decided to discontinue the regular program of lunchtime events, which we've held here at the National Liberal Club since 2008. That's quite some time ago. And before that, for two years at St. Stephen's Club. It's not goodbye, though. Uh, we will retain our membership for those who'd like it, as we will be ho hosting ad hoc events on pressing issues when the occasion demands. When there's a major issue we think can do well with the discussion, we will hold another of these meetings. Uh, there are a lot of uh, face complex and intractable challenges facing us in the world today. I think more so than any time that I can remember during my political life, certainly uh, since the 1970s. For over 17 years, GSF has sought to contribute to a better understanding of these challenges from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq when we started back in 2006, and the ongoing failures of the Middle East peace process, although at least then people were still able to talk about a peace process, through to the global financial crisis, the rise of China, the challenges of the Brexit process, climate security, cyber, artificial intelligence, the Russia-Ukraine war, and conflict once again in the Middle East. Many of you have very kindly written to me to say how beneficial and welcome you found the forum for open discussion that GSF has been able to provide over the years. Today I would like to celebrate the achievements of GSF over the past two decades in style. And what better way to do so than by reconvening three of our foreign policy gurus, or the three tenors as I like to describe them, <laughs> uh, from the GSF advisory board. I have with me here today Ming Campbell, the Right Honourable Lord Campbell of Pitt and Weem. Ming's a former, former leader of the Liberal Party, the Liberal Democrats Party. The Right Honourable Sir Malcolm Rifkind on my left, both a former Foreign Secretary and a former Defence Secretary, and for a number of years Chairman of the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament. And last but certainly not least, the Right Honourable Jack Straw, also a Foreign Secretary as well as Home Secretary and a Secretary of State for Justice. You collected those offices as you went along. <laughs> We're delighted to see you all here today. These three are going to discuss the question, and I'm going to read it out, making UK foreign policy in a more contested and volatile world, priorities, challenges, and choices for the new Foreign Secretary. I'm effectively asking each of them to put themselves in David Cameron's shoes and to tell us what they think are the main challenges facing him and what his priorities and policy responses should be. The title of today's discussion is drawn from the integrated review, Refresh 2023, which was called Responding to a More Contested and Volatile World, and which updated the government's security, defence, development and foreign policy priorities to reflect the significant changes in the global context since the integrated review in 2021. They're each going to talk to us for about seven to eight minutes. Malcolm will start us off, <coughs> then Jack and finally Ming. We'll then have a short discussion between the four of us, if I think time permits, before I open it to question and answers. Uh, and as I've always done for the past 17 years without fail, I will end off up on the dot of 2 p.m but please do feel, to fee feel free to stay for a drink or to finish the rest of the buffet after that, if there is anything left to finish of the buffet. <laughs> I'm not going to spend time reading our guests' uh, distinguished biographies. Their achievements are so many, it would take most of an hour to do so. And I know that you also received biographies with the invitation which was sent out. I will say, though, that I've had the immense privilege of being able to draw on their experience and their deep knowledge over the years to GSF's great benefit, and they've been generous to a fault with the time and advice they've been prepared to give me. I'm delighted also that a number of GSF's advisory board are also here today, 
Uh, I see Jock Stirrup sitting in the front, uh, David Howell, David Manning, and Sir Richard Barons, who have all been very constructive over the years in making sure we kept our feet on the ground. I think we could all agree that uh, Lord Cameron, in his new role as Foreign Secretary, certainly has his work cut out for him as he attempts to chart a course for British foreign policy in what is an extraordinarily fragmented and disrupted world. But if he could have access to the same expertise and wisdom that GSF has had, and for which we'll hear more today, the prospects for an effective, coherent British foreign policy would, I have to say, be immeasurably brighter. <laughs> On that note, Malcolm, I'm going to ask you to start off. Well, thank you very much, Michael. I know I speak for everyone here in wishing to begin by paying tribute to you for founding the Global Strategy Forum. I remember still the conversation we had when it was just an idea in your head, and I smiled sweetly and said, what an interesting idea, never for a moment believing that so many years later it would have achieved so much. And I think we're all thrilled to know it's not ending, it's simply changing its format. Uh, now, we've been asked to comment on what we would do if we were in David Cameron's uh, uh, position as the new Foreign Secretary. Uh, I think if it had been me, the first thing I would have said is I demand a recount. Uh, uh, not because I didn't enjoy doing the job, but because it is a very difficult and complex operation. And Cameron, of course, although he's been seeped in foreign policy, has never been foreign secretary or a minister in the foreign office. Uh, he's sort of worked with the diplomats. I was once told that diplomats were people who could be disarming, especially when their countries weren't. Uh, and that can also be a challenge uh, in itself. Harold Macmillan, briefly a foreign secretary, uh, famously said in his memoirs, uh, Foreign Secretary, because of the very cruel, specific issues he has to deal with, Foreign Secretary's speeches uh, always put him in a cruel dilemma. He will hover between the cliché and the indiscretion. And then he said they will either be dull or dangerous. Uh, in my experience, some are both, but that is not going to involve naming names. What I would like to do, if I may, in my few remarks, just look at the four specific issues that the new foreign secretary and any foreign minister, certainly in the Western world, has to deal with at this moment in time. And I start with the United Kingdom's relationship with Europe. And it's worth remembering whatever your views are or were on Brexit, uh, the issues of national security, the issues of foreign policy, were not the issues on which that referendum was fought. And indeed, the EU's involvement in national security and defense in the potential threat from Russia, it has a crucial role to play. Uh, but that was not something which needs to have been influenced by, the, by Britain's departure from the European Union. Now, I pay credit to Sunak because, frankly, during the Johnson and Truss periods, uh, the United Kingdom was an embarrassment. It was as if Silvio Berlusconi had become prime minister. That's now behind us. And although Sunak has his own travails to deal with, what we saw was a resolution uh, of the Northern Ireland issue, that's now gone off the horizon. <laughs> and when I say horizon, we've now rejoined horizon, uh, that extraordinary research initiative, which it was always desperately sad to have been uh, exited from. So that side of things are relatively smooth. But what we need to do is work so closely, not just with the EU as an institution, but particularly, I make no secret of the fact, with Germany and France, uh, and of course Poland, representing perhaps the most, um, with a new government in Poland, uh, because any threat to France or Germany of a national security kind is a threat to the United Kingdom as well, and vice versa. And that goes back <laughs> to the war against Hitler, it goes back to the First World War, it goes back to the Napoleonic Wars, uh, where the United Kingdom always deemed a threat to Europe was a threat to our own independence and security. That has not changed one whit. So that is what I say on the European issue, and that has to be at the forefront of the new Foreign Secretary's thoughts. Let me then take, as it logically does, to the take us to the situation of Ukraine. And you're all familiar with Ukraine. I'm not going to go into the detail of that. But I want to make two points, which I think the British government needs to concentrate on, which they are broadly doing, to be fair. But it, we're at a very crucial time when the momentum of the uh, Ukrainian advance has obviously stalled, and simultaneously, Huge problems in Congress about funding Ukraine 
and also problems in the European Union, where Orban, the Hungarian uh, prime minister, is refusing to produce the unanimous vote required to provide the cash required. So the first point I want to make, and I think it's not a problem for the United Kingdom, but it's a problem for some other countries and some other governments. We should not be put into the situation where we think we have to publicly advise the Ukrainians whether the time has come for them to start negotiating with the Russians. And I say that quite unreservedly, because at the end of the day, this is about Ukraine's future, and although it has massive implications for other countries, at this moment in time, at least 70,000 Ukrainians have given their lives, probably substantially more. And for all practical purposes, not a single American, Briton, Frenchman or German has done so. Of course, there might be individual examples, but you know what I'm saying. So we do not have a right to say that simply because we're spending a lot of money helping Ukraine, uh, therefore we should put pressure on them, even if that was what we thought was the right thing to do, to go for some sort of so-called negotiation with Russia. The time may very well come when that becomes appropriate, but it must be for the Ukrainians themselves to decide when that time has come, and we should not depart from that view. And linked to that is this thorny question of Ukraine and NATO membership. And the British government's current position uh, is to support NATO membership for Ukraine. I've always had very serious doubts about that. But the only point I want to make in the time available is simply this. Whatever the arguments for or against Ukraine's membership of NATO, you certainly do not admit as a new member of NATO a country which at the moment of their admission is in a major war with its neighbor, which has been going on for a couple of years and may continue for a long time to come. Because then you'd be faced with an impossible choice as a NATO member, they are entitled to expect Americans, Brits, French to come to their rescue if required. Not to their rescue, that's an unfair way of putting it, but to join the battle. And that could be the beginning a war of a war with Russia by the United States with all the horrors that that could produce. But if you don't come to their aid militarily with boots on the ground, but they are members of NATO, then you are devaluing what Article 5 of the NATO Treaty is all about. So that is my view on that. The third point I want to comment, only our four you'll be pleased to know, the third comment I want to comment on is the obvious Middle Eastern situation today of uh, Israel and uh, Hamas. Uh, I think the Israelis are right not to, at this particular moment in time, go for a ceasefire. That would be hugely to the advantage of Hamas in preserving their ability to carry out the atrocities they carried out on October the 7th again, and they have publicly said that's what they want to do if they have the power to do so. They're not suggesting this was a one-off. So I think that would be a mistake. But I actually was rather relieved that the United Kingdom government abstained at the Security Council vote. And uh, abstention is not necessarily a cop-out. It's sometimes when you think the arguments are very finely balanced. And what has worried me about the Israeli position is that despite the obvious representations from the United States and others, I don't believe the Israelis ever deliberately target civilians. I'm absolutely certain they don't deliberately target civilians, which Hamas certainly does. But, you know, even if you try to avoid civilian casualties, it is a subjective point for the generals on the ground, unless they get instructions from their own government, as to how much care you take uh, to minimize uh, what would otherwise be serious civilian losses of men, women, and children in order to get to your military target. It's not simply an obvious decision that has to be taken. It's a spec, particularly when you're dealing with urban warfare. The other point I want to make about the Israel-Hamas situation is that what the British government should be joining others in saying, and saying it unequivocally, is even if the military battle that's going on at the moment is 100% successful in its military objectives. It cannot provide a long-term peace unless it is followed by a political initiative to resume in some way and in some format a political dialogue with the Palestinians in Gaza and West Bank about their long-term relationship with uh, Israel. We know from the Iraq experience Getting rid of Saddam Hussein was the easy part. Uh, it was the failure to contemplate what came next and to have anything that rationally came next that led to all the disasters. 
Now, when people say, well, what is the long-term relationship? Uh, it happened to fall to me when I was Foreign Secretary uh, to commit formally the United Kingdom government to a two-state solution. We'd always been sympathetic, but had never been formally committed. Uh, I uh, made that particular announcement, and I've never departed from that. And uh, the simplest way I can put it is that if you don't want a two-state solution, there is no other, even theoretical, solution that could possibly deliver the results required. And when people say, well, that's all very well, but it's completely out of the question at the moment, you should not be so pessimistic as that implies. I was present at Yitzhak Rabin's funeral after he'd been assassinated. And on the follow and I'd met him before, and on the following day, I was staying in the Middle East for two or three days. My program was to go and visit Yasser Arafat in Gaza, which is what I did. And I'd done it once before in Gaza. I didn't find him particularly agreeable, but it was a proper serious discussion. And it lasted normally an hour. On this occasion, after half an hour, he said, I hope you'll excuse me terminating this discussion. I have to climb into my car. I am being driven to Israel to visit Leah Rabin, Rabin's widow, to offer my condolences. Arafat and Rabin's widow. Now, today, that is inconceivable. Years before I, he made that remark to me, it would have been inconceivable. But it shows that there was that period, that window, and it continued to Ehud Barak's attempt to negotiate a deal with, uh, and, and they got very, very close. The Israeli cabinet had ratified 85% of the West Bank and the whole of Gaza and part of Jerusalem being transferred to a new Palestinian state. So if that has happened once, yes, it's incredibly more difficult now because of the settlers and all that sort of thing, but there is no other alternative. Very final point, because I'm conscious of the time, on China. And in China, I simply make this point. China is so dependent on the West, and the West is so dependent on China economically, that the consequence of a total disruption, as we have with Russia unavoidably, would be infinitely ghastly for both China and the United States and Europe. And I simply conclude by saying the best way this was demonstrated as to what should be done uh, in terms of the West relationship with China, broadly where we are at the moment, that we collect, this was what Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State of America, said, where we can collaborate with China, which we ought to be able to do on environmental matters, on uh, global health issues, on nuclear weapons. When we can collaborate, we should do so. When we can compete with them, which is mostly on trade, then we should do so. But where we have fundamental differences, then it must be adversarial on human rights, on Hong Kong, and on Taiwan, and a number of other issues of that kind, the Uyghurs and so forth. So it's a difficult balance, but it's as difficult for the Chinese as it is for us. And I end on that note. Thank you very much. Um, Jack. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. And can I endorse Malcolm's comments about the fantastic work you have done with Jacqueline Jinx uh, over there in sustaining uh, the Global Strategy Forum and indeed, in your case, uh, funding it. Uh, and also say that I endorse uh, almost all of uh, that which uh, uh, the remarks that Malcolm uh, has uh, made. The f I've, I was thinking about this in the context of, of my um, taking over as Foreign Secretary in June 2001. Uh, and the uh, advice uh, that I'd give to any incoming foreign secretary is uh, be prepared for the totally unexpected. Because uh, the period when I took over in uh, June 2001 was internationally relatively quiet. Um, my wife couldn't quite believe that I was getting home at a reasonable civilised hour as, as I was then compared to my period as a home secretary. And this halcyon period went on uh, until... Uh, September the 11th, uh, and early that morning, um, we saw what happened. And at that stage, the world changed, but also all those volumes of briefing that had been done for me about where I was to go and the, the, the conflicts that were going to arise had to be ditched, and we had to start afresh. So um, what is above all needed, I draw from, from that, is you've, you've got to have the capability within... Uh, 
the UK's overall uh, overseas uh, capacity to, to respond rapidly to events. That means sustaining our defence capability, it means sustaining our intelligence capability, and it means sustaining our diplomacy as well. And that, in turn, may mean that we need to put a question mark, or a bigger question mark, over the size of the overseas aid programme. I don't want to be driven out of the brownies here, but I have said publicly um, that one of the changes that I agree with uh, that this government has made is to bring the Overseas Development Administration within the, the purview of, of the Foreign Secretary and the Foreign Office. Because it frankly made no sense to have competing foreign policies, which uh, a situation which I and many uh, successes uh, encountered. But alongside that, we, I'm, I'm, let me say I'm not a li little Englander, I'm very much in favour of overseas development assistance. But I don't wish to, to see this country having to commit itself to a percentage of our GDP, which is completely arbitrary and which was established in 1970 as a result of a kind of compromise uh, in the UN General Assembly. That's 53 years ago. And in my view, the, those involved in uh, overseas development need to be able need to compete for those resources alongside other parts of our overseas effort and uh, of uh, our domestic effort as well. And if there's a good case, and that's shared by colleagues, then they'll get it. And if it's a poor case, they won't. But what I really uh, disliked was seeing uh, that ring fenced, and meanwhile defence uh, spending uh, suffering, and also uh, foreign, uh, foreign, foreign policy, well, foreign policy suffering as well. Because when the unexpected happens, it's not aid that you you, you need to reach for; it's a sense of what mili military capabilities you've got, but above all, what diplomacy you can bring uh, to bear, and that that does require. Um, uh, British posts abroad, and it requires highly trained uh, diplomats. Now, the other thing I, I, I'd say, and, and I'm afraid we've seen the opposite sometimes in recent years, is any, I, anybody who, becomes, who does anything in diplomacy, not least if they're the foreign minister, needs to understand where the other country is coming from that they're talking to. And for one thing certain, that's not going to be where they're coming from. Histories are different, and particularly if they've had involvement with the United Kingdom, as most countries uh, around the world have done, their perspective is simply going to be uh, different. And lecturing people from a narrow UK or Western perspective does no good uh, at all. Um, may have done once when we, in the 19th century, when this place was ruling supreme, a sort of testament, a temple uh, to uh, liberal imperialism, uh, this place, uh, but it, it doesn't work uh, today. On specifics, um, I, I agree with Malcolm about the fact that we've got to nurture and sustain our traditional relationships. That includes with the US. We may end up with a, a Trump II presidency. Um, if we do, we can have to grin and bear it, difficult though that will be. But that requires even more uh, working by us of uh, Congress, of, of individual states, uh, to, to prove the value of the relationship with the, with the uh, UK against a background where in, in, the, in the White House you'll have a, 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 a quixotic uh, and probably rampant president, but he won't be there forever. Um, we, we, um, I agree with what Malcolm said about uh, China. Um, and one of the key th things you've got to bear in mind in diplomacy is that it's most important when uh, you, you've got conflicts uh, arising. So that's why I strongly support maintaining diplomatic relations, it's extremely difficult, with Russia, with North Korea, uh, with, with Iran, and recognising in respect to China, not lumping China in with those three, that our, our relationships are much more complicated with China, um, not least because of the extent of our economic reliance on China. Um, and... Um, they, they, uh, we need, as, as Malcolm was saying, need to collaborate wherever we can and where, where we can't uh, to express our disagreement in uh, fairly strident terms. 
just on a, a last point on, on the uh, Middle East. Uh, had a horrendous situation. I um, also share the view of, of uh, Labour's front bench that now is not the time for a full-blown ceasefire because it would hand power back to Hamas and we'd be in a rerun of this. They would be claiming victory, I'm afraid. Um, such is their kind of uh, death wish. But we also need to understand that this situation arose, as many in Israel are themselves saying, as a consequence of a completely flawed strategy by Netanyahu over at least a decade and a half. And what he did, and very much him, was to big up Hamas, ensure that Hamas got loads of funding channeled through Qatar and much else, I mean, under their noses, building those tunnels, holding exercises about how they could break out of, of, of the fences. And meanwhile, which is even worse in a way, seeking to diminish the authority of a really shaky uh, Palestinian authority on, on the West Bank and de deliberately undermining them. And I mean, they're now talking about uh, maybe giving the, the PA and the West Bank back the tax revenue to which it's entitled, which is it's sort of held in some kind of strange escrow account uh, by Israel. But you reap what you sow, and I'm afraid Netanyahu uh, has reaped uh, what, what he, he sowed there. So I'm praying that um, when the immediate, as it were, hot military action in the Middle East is over, that Netanyahu uh, will get his just desserts, and if the opinion polls at the moment are in Israel are accurate, that he will finally be forced uh, to resign and the Likud party that very seriously diminished, along with the power which these even more extreme settlers on the West Bank are, are exercising. Um, we read too little about that, but I, you know, many of us here will have been to places like Hebron. I mean, I've seen a most disgusting sights of a brand new settlement up on the hill protected by Israeli soldiers um, where and down below a Palestinian settlement where they're living in, in, in tents the, the Israelis up on this illegal settlement were getting water at one-fifth of the price that they that the, 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 the Palestinians were having to buy from tankers um, when, it, when the tankers arrived and also suffering the idea of coming in from time to time to destroy uh, the systems, the tanks in which uh, the, the water was placed. I mean, just outrageous, gratuitous disruption, for a, but for a good reason uh, from their point of view, which was to steal... Palestinian land. And we need to, if we want to see peace in the Middle East, we want to protect the Israelis, Jewish Israelis' future as much as anybody else. We need to proclaim about the outrage that is going on there. This is not, a, not remotely a reason for descending into criticism about the state of Israel, which I strongly uh, support, but it is uh, about the, the policies which Netanyahu and those further to the right to, to him have followed. I said at the beginning uh, that uh, any foreign secretary has to be prepared for the unexpected. Well, the Middle East is one of the things which is expected, uh, and that will fester uh, and continue to fester uh, unless the international community takes some action in respect of it. Yes, the US are, are the single most important power which can affect what Israel does, for sure, and therefore if affect any possibility of the Middle East settlement. But we can have an effect. I'm quite clear about that. And particularly if we join hands uh, with our European colleagues and others, including China and, Russia, uh, China, uh, and India or on, on this one, to try over a period to get what we know is the only possible solution, which is that two-state solution of two states living side by side in relative peace and harmony. Thank you very much. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Min Campbell. I rather take a different emphasis on the question of a ceasefire. Uh, there is no definition of appropriate uh, in the uh, argument 
uh, that when you are subject to an attack, you have the right to defend yourself and your territory. But I venture to suggest that the level of attack on Gaza uh, certainly worries at that standard and indeed, in some respects, beats it. It's described as collateral damage. Collateral, I thought, was understood to mean incidental. A large amount of the <coughs> tanks, the aircraft, uh, all of the sophistications which the Israeli army obviously embraces because of that's always been part of its makeup. I think that goes beyond what's proportionate. And were I living in Gaza at the moment, then I would be hoping and praying for an end to the level of the action being taken. Proportionate must mean, in my view, that the method you use is proportionate and that the results you achieve by virtue of that method are also proportionate. And so I'm rather stronger of the view. Uh, and indeed, uh, if we are ever to get rescue for those who were taken prisoner, the hostages, <coughs> then I find it a little difficult to see how that is going to be affected unless there is a ceasefire. Now, we were asked to put ourselves in the position of the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. And may I say, if I seem a little nervous, it's because these days liberal Democrat politicians don't get the chance to, to address so many people at one time. <laughs> <laughs> but it, had I been given the job, I would certainly have felt a little nervous. But so I've got some practical ideas that he might want to take up. The first, of course, is to deal with the question of Europe. And in that respect, I do agree with, with Malcolm. Uh, we never examined properly the relationship between Norway uh, and Switzerland and the European Union. Uh, it seems to me that that would be well worth doing again and properly in order to establish if there was a level of agreement, uh, a concerted response uh, between ourselves and the European Union. Because I am not uh, optimistic uh, about the outcome of the American presidential election. Because leave aside the question of the presidency, remember that in the House of Representatives already, and indeed last week in the Senate, there are those who are taking the view that uh, enough is enough for Ukraine. And Ukraine itself does present something of a problem, and it's this. Uh, if you join NATO, uh, you agree to subscribe to uh, all of the apparatus, if you like, of a civil society. But Ukraine is bedeviled by corruption. There's even corruption when it comes to s supplying the, eat thi the, th the things that the soldiers have to eat at the front. Uh, and much as I admire the extraordinary tenacity uh, of the people fighting for their own country, then I think to import that into NATO would be to fail to uh, um, retain a standard which is a necessary part of it. And we forget always in this discussion that Georgia got the same undertaking. No one talks about Georgia anymore. Well, that's perhaps because of the influence of Russia. Uh, and the consequences which there might be for Georgia, were there to be a similar treatment for Georgia now as there is for Ukraine. So I said to you I was going to be a bit practical. Um, I've had a look. There have been 11 foreign secretaries since 2001. What that does for the morale of the upon the Commonwealth and Development Office, I'm not quite sure. I may say that Jack is the longest serving of that five years. Uh, and it does seem to me uh, that the importance of foreign policy 
uh, is not being properly recognized by consecutive governments. And therefore, were I to be David Cameron, then I would be trying to force the whole issue of foreign commonwealth and development uh, issues much further up the menu. The, the menu. There is another point, too, which I think is, is worth exploring, and that's this. Foreign policy on its own, uh, very good thing. But when foreign policy is backed by successful economies, it is much more effective. And at the moment, you can hardly describe our economy as being effective. And again, were I the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, I would be arguing very strongly that the best way of ensuring that Britain's influence remains, and indeed even expands, uh, is to ensure that we now have an economy which no longer displays these terrible consequences and attributes uh, of the last two or three years. The other point I wanted to make, and I see it's 22, so I should, I should finish, and, and it's this. Uh, foreign policy is, and uh, foreign relations are not something you pick up and let go. I'm not suggesting we need a Lavrov, but what I am suggesting is this, that the best foreign policy outcomes are based on acquaintance, on experience, <coughs> and on respect. And if you can not only have these qualities, but ensure that they influence everything that you do in the Foreign Office, then that seems to me much more likely to achieve the kind of beneficial outcome which we would hope for. He's a lucky man, though. It may be something of uh, a trial and a tribulation, but he has all those qualities that I have just uh, outlined, uh, and he has an experience if you like, on the front line, perhaps a little dated. Uh, but remember, Muhammad Ali made a comeback. There's always room for a comeback. Uh, I'm not going to get into uh, two questions of the day, which my, my colleagues did, because very largely, subject to the qualifications I've indicated, I agree with them in general. Enough from me. Thank you very much. I think we've had three very interesting contributions and I hope they've generated a lot of questions. I'm going to allow about 15 minutes for questions, so if I call you, can you keep your questions brief? Can you introduce yourself and say who you are? And can you wait until the microphone arrives? Jacqueline will be going round with the microphone because then other people can actually hear what the question is, which makes it much more interesting when the answer comes. So I'm going to, first of all, take the gentleman in the second row here. Thank you. Ali Bahajouk, North South Publications. The United Nations General Assembly is actually meeting today to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, do you think that the US will be alone uh, after probably 190 countries are going to vote for it. Thank you. Malcolm, would you like to start on that? Well, you've got to take on board the fact that the United Nations General Assembly, whenever issues involving Israel are being discussed, have always been, by a substantial majority, hostile to Israel. That has been the history. And it's reflected by the fact that you have uh, not just the Arab states, uh, which are quite numerous, but you have 60 members of the Islamic Conference, so other countries that are not themselves Arab states tend to identify with the Palestinian point of view. Uh, and therefore, I'm not sure that it necessarily reflects the real dynamic that is at work as to whether there should or should not be a ceasefire. I'm sure there will be other countries as well as the United States uh, that will either vote against or uh, uh, abstain. But it's a given inevitability that there will be a large majority in favor but that reflects historic priorities. It doesn't just reflect a judgment at this moment as to whether there should be a ceasefire and what its implications would be. So just, just to say, um, I, I agree with Ming that uh, some of the Israelis' response 
uh, to the massacre on October the 7th has been disproportionate, and it, and it goes into uh, uh, some of the military doctrine which uh, the IDF are using, uh, and I think is, is, is wrong in their own terms. The, the, so I w but the, the, the difficulty is if you have a unilateral a ceasefire, just so the IDF stops, um, what happens then? Um, I mean, there may be uh, some negotiations about the return of prisoners, in, but if, if, if you're simply going to end up with a return, as it were, to the status quo ante, then you'll see uh, Hamas regrouping. Because, I mean, Hamas is not a, a single entity, but, but at the moment, the kind of nihilist wing of Hamas is the one that holds sway uh, within that organisation. They'll revert to what they, they, they know best, which is uh, or, uh, killing people and also holding uh, people in Gaza uh, subject to their authoritarian uh, rules. So it's a horrible situation. I certainly want to see an humanitarian pause and an extended humanitarian pause. Uh, but I think we'd be, frankly be naive in believing that having a ceasefire uh, without, a, without any limit is going to resolve this issue. I don't think it would do. Do you want to well, add? I'd be repeating myself. Other than this, <coughs> I mean, Gaza's been laid waste. What's going to, you know, getting two pieces of wood to stick together is going to be quite remarkable. How long can you think that that is proportionate? And how long can you think that you would not find any possible way you could to bring it to a conclusion? Just Imagine for a moment what it's like if you're a member of these families. They're losing 10, 11. The families, of course, are much broader uh, sort of institution, perhaps, that, than we recognize in this country. Just imagine how you recover from that. And just imagine how easy it is to be a recruiting sergeant if you're able to point to issues of the kind we are discussing. Could I just add one point, if I may? It's worth remembering the precedent of Mosul when it was occupied by Islamic State and a decision was taken by the international community uh, that, that they had to be eliminated from Mosul and there were a lot of civilian casualties because uh, ISIS fought building by building and so forth. So the parallels are quite substantial and you've got to take into account the overall judgment. Do you believe this is a terrorist organization that needs to be destroyed? If you don't believe that, that's a different answer you come to. But if you do believe it is, uh, then there are many precedents, uh, not in detail, but in substance, for the sad consequence that, hap uh, that affects many civilians. Can I just, before I take the next question, just make one point. I think somebody made the point that Israel has always been at the sharp end of the United Nations reactions. I think it is worth remembering that Israel was created by the United Nations, <coughs> just to put the balance on that. Gentleman in the middle. David Logan, uh, OFCO LAG. Uh, it's a question, I think, for Malcolm. Uh, I agree with him absolutely about on, the, on Ukraine, that Ukraine must not become a NATO member, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, I also agree with him that it's not for us to negotiate some kind of settlement with Russia. But Ukraine has become almost entirely dependent on NATO for military supplies and, and other aid. So this has become a proxy war between NATO and Russia. And Malcolm, I wonder, don't you think that it is inconceivable that NATO could afford to lose even a proxy war with Russia? Uh, the lessons that would send for our future relationship with Russia would be unthinkable. So does he not think that Russia has to be defeated, and that any settlement must be on terms which are recognized by Russia as well, as one in which they have been defeated uh, and cannot try something like this again. Thanks. Malcolm. I, I have no objection in principle to what you say. I just find it very difficult to believe that, you can de that Ukraine can defeat Russia, even if the United States was to, and others were to continue to provide Ukraine with all the weapons at their disposal. Hitler tried, Napoleon tried. Uh, you can't defeat Russia. What is certainly possible 
uh, is that Ukraine, with su sufficient military support, could regain the remaining territory that they lost two years ago. Uh, they've already regained half of it, and therefore it is possible that that might happen. But that would not mean that Putin would surrender and say, it's all over. He doesn't need to do that unless domestically within Russia he finds popular uh, uh, disapproval uh, of the war continuing. And that might happen. It was what happened in 1917 when the Tsar was overthrown because of the First World War and the, the bad showing that the uh, Russian army was showing at that time. So you can get popular resistance, but we're not anywhere near there uh, at, at this moment in time, sadly. Lady right at the back. Thank you very much. I'm Valentina Barbacci. Um, sorry to bring it back to Israel, the Middle East. Um, but I wanted to just raise two points, or rather not points, question um, the three of you on a couple of points. One is the uh, genuine approach to this being an attack on Hamas, um, given A, what you said earlier, that Netanyahu and, Itza and Ehud Barak funded the, the building of the tunnels, and secondly, the, the level of destruction that is happening right now in the civilian people. And uh, because we know that there are Hamas members all over the world, so if this were really an attack, an attack on Hamas, I think we have the GPS coordinates of significant <laughs> members um, elsewhere that we could really pinpoint. So one is around the question of whether this is truly about um, finding and outrooting Hamas, and secondly, is around um, the original original source or the, uh, the the origination of Hamas. It you know was funded. It was founded in 1987. Um, after the first intifada, uh, as a result of the Israeli occupation. So perhaps we could address that. Uh, um, uh, it's not, it can't be boiled down to just that, but certainly that is one of the main issues, and perhaps we could, I just welcome your thoughts on whether this sh occupation should continue. Thank you. Jack. Well, um, uh, Madam, I was about to write, I, th I think you can body swerve on this issue, if you don't mind me saying so. Um, you know, what, the, the, when you presented with evidence about the fact this was an unprovoked attack by Hamas, people say, what about this, what about that? Um, and um, so my answer to your first question is this was an attack by Hamas. I mean, Hamas have, have, have broadcast the fact. Uh, they've proclaimed it. Um, I think from my reading, uh, uh, not, not of the press here, but of the Middle East press, um, they miscalculated and particularly what the, f the fact that Israel only had three uh, regiments in the south because all the rest were trying to uh, protect illegal settlers in, in the West Bank. And they expected a much greater level of resistance, and therefore that it, it would, they, their fighters would be fighting IDF's uh, personnel. And in fact, they, um, their, 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 their blood was up. There was no military resistance or to speak of, and, and uh, they went on this appalling uh, rampage. But it, it, it is them and, they, and the leadership, particularly the people sitting pretty in uh, Qatar, who you know, orchestrated this, have to bear responsibility for it. And the other thing just to bear in mind, for people say, well, call a ceasefire. I mean, they, I don't know how, it, it requires two sides for a ceasefire. Hamas could have a ceasefire tomorrow, if they wanted, uh, very easily, by saying they'd... Uh, release the, the hostages, and yes, in, in return for some release of uh, uh, Palestinian prisoners. But that could be organized if they made it clear that they, they were ready uh, uh, to stop, but they're not, not going to do it. On, look, on the history, the history of, 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 you know, some of the history, I know some of the history, is, has been contested for 100 years. Um, and uh, yes, um, the Israelis know that, for example, there are tunnels uh, underneath that hospital um, because they built them. Um, that doesn't make, make it a, necessarily a bad, I mean, it's a, for, for, good, for good reasons or, or, or bad, the geology of the area makes it very easy to tunnel. Um, what I think is, is odder is that uh, the Israelis knew that, uh, about this very extensive network of, of tunnels and allowed it to happen. But this was part of Netanyahu's strategy, which was to big up Hamas to, to uh, reduce... The, the, the significance of Fatah and the Palestinian Authority, in order that he could then say, well, he can't, Fatah's finished, 
Hamas is very strong, but it's a terrorist organisation. Ergo, you can't have a two-state solution at all because there's no effective partners. That's what Netanyahu is about in his strategy. It's come apart. OK, but I mean, that, and that's, there's some history there, but now we've got to deal with the present. And the present is uh, getting Hamas to accept by one means or another <coughs> that they can't behave this, like this, uh, this way. And secondly, um, when it's quietened down, uh, seeing an end to Netanyahu and the extremist settlers behind him, and then, hopefully, seeing conditions for the beginnings of a negotiation. And I've now got time for at least one question, and possibly, if the answers are reasonably brief, two questions. Uh, this is one which has been submitted from outside by Peter Snow, who's long supported GSF. Would any of you take any steps over the next few years, I'm going to give this to all of you, over the next few years to return to the EU, such as rejoining the single market? Ming, I'm going to ask you to go first. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm saving time for you. Uh, <laughs> the answer is no, for this reason. I, when we had Brexit, I thought, well, maybe we could stay in the single market, like uh, Norway or Switzerland or whatever, until I looked into what that meant. And, of course, for Norway and Switzerland to have the benefits of the internal market, they have to agree not only that all existing EU legislation becomes part of their domestic law insofar as it affects the internal market, but also future legislation, which they will play no part in actually negotiating or deciding. And that is politically impossible. The idea that the House of Commons or any, anybody in Parliament would agree that for all time to come, any EU law on the single market will have to become part of our domestic legislation without any ability to amend or veto it. It's a, a non-starter, sadly. Well, can I just say, <coughs> both Switzerland and Norway are countries which much value their independence. But they're very small they, countries, me. But they're, well... They, they are. They have not look. They, they don't I have... Hope they, I hope they're listening. Sorry, forgive me. They're, they're, forgive I, me. I, I hope they're listening. I mean, they're rather big countries in many ways. They punch above their weight. Uh, but countries which value independence as much as they do are willing to accept what you've just described because not only of the financial and economic advantage... There is the political advantage. Why do we not emphasize more the political consequences of leaving membership of the European Union, particularly when, as I've already hinted, we may find ourselves things uh, in a rather different state across the Atlantic? It's, in, it's interesting to see that Europe always opens a good, <laughs> constructive <laughs> debate. Well, I mean, Jack, I'm going to ask you to um, finish. You know, I, I argued as strongly as you and Malcolm uh, did to stay inside the European Union, but we lost, and there were reasons uh, why, why we lost, uh, and why we, in a sense, collectively hadn't made the argument about the importance of, of being in, in the EU. But uh, I think if, for a Labour leader or Labour party now to commit itself oh, to reopening membership uh, uh, and having and calling it a, 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 a referendum would be a revised definition of insanity. Uh, uh, and the, there would be people in Tory central office who will be praying for this. For, I mean, and Malcolm's also spelt it out. I mean, look, Norway is a very rich country. It has a balance of payments surplus, um, which we, you know, we, we don't often talk about these yeah. days, but, it makes it, but it's a, big, it's a small, small population, very rich, and it, and it can be fairly independent. And for other reasons... Um, uh, uh, Switzerland's the same. We're not in, in that position. And we'd simply end up as a rule taker, having to put up with those rules. We, we couldn't do it. Well, what we should do instead is advance towards a closer relationship with the EU. And I mean, one of the things that has already started to happen under Mr. Sunak, to give him, to do him justice, uh, is that we should stop insulting uh, European uh, leaders. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, that's a start and a, that, a refreshing change from his two predecessors. Look at the time. No, th I'm afraid not. I think we must actually call it towards a close. Uh, I just want to make a few remarks myself, incidentally, but thank you very much. You, could I say, because I failed to, uh, failed to at the beginning, how much I appreciate the contribution you've made to this organisation and made it really a place where people were anxious not only to come and listen, but people are anxious to come and speak. Altogether, it's made a very valuable contribution to the discussion of foreign Thank affairs. You very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much. I have to say, I think we have surpassed our own expectations in the success of this organization. It's been great fun for me, and I think it has been constructive. I hoped it would be. Uh, it's been constructive partly because of the enormous wealth of experience of the speakers we've had available to us, but also thanks to those who have worked behind the scenes to make this work. They know who they are, and I would like to say thank you to them very much indeed. And finally, to say thank you to all of you, because an organization like this does not exist in a vacuum. It's been your continued presence, in sometimes in varying numbers, at these meetings that has made this organization feel dynamic and has actually produced some good ideas which may or may not have been adopted by politicians around the world. I'll never know. But anyway, thank you very much for coming along today. And would you like to thank our three panelists on the traditional way?